There's no introduction this morning because of traffic by the introducer, so I'll have to introduce myself. Jim Gasella, I'm a professor of neurogenetics, Harvard Medical School, Mass General Hospital, and uh, have been doing genetics over there for the last almost 40 years. And what I want to tell you about today is that despite the fact that there's massive amounts of work being done in human genetics and disease with polymorphisms that all have very small effects, um, there's knowledge to be gained through polymorphisms that have large effects, that is Mendelian uh, genetics, uh, but that they're really not separate entities. They're really just part of a spectrum of effect size and interaction. So to put everybody on the same page, when I say genetics or the study of genetics, it's basically relating differences in DNA sequence between individuals to differences in some measurable characteristic, a phenotype. So genotype to phenotype relationship is it. That's genetics. Uh, I don't think about gene regulation or anything else. It's just if, if the expression level of a gene is the expressed characteristic that you're looking at, that's the phenotype, you can relate genetics to that phenotype. Incred important to the approaches to studying genetics is the fact that the DNA is not packaged as individual genes, but as long single strands uh, that are continuous within a chromosome, but separate from other chromosomes. So each one of the chromosomes, which comes in pairs, is a very long string of contiguous DNA, meaning every gene on that chromosome is attached to every other gene on that chromosome. Uh, and of course, you get you know, one chromosome from each parent, then you get a, a sex chromosomes, X or Y, determines your male or female. And that is the essentially the, uh, the, op, the both the code and the operating system to generate a new individual. All of the information is necessary, that's necessary is in there uh, if passed on appropriately. And it's passed on through families such that if you have an expressed characteristic that relates directly to a difference in DNA sequence, you can follow that characteristic through the families and define a pattern of inheritance. The pattern of inheritance telling you something about what that DNA variation uh, is doing in terms of its mode of operation. So the top left here is autosomal dominant pattern, which basically just means that one copy out of the two chromosomes having the variant sequence that you're relating to phenotype is sufficient to cause that phenotype. And since you've got two chromosomes, on average, you're going to pass one or the other to, to children. So 50% of the children will receive the one that has the particular variant. It always causes the phenotype. So you'll see a dominant inheritance where every generation that that allele is passed on, you see the expressed characteristic. Typical dominant diseases, there are many, uh, involve functions usually uh, that are uh, dysregulated with respect to the disease, with the normal function of a protein. Uh, as opposed to recessive inheritance, where it takes two bad copies of the gene, two different mutations or two copies of the same mutation with no normal copy of the gene to cause the phenotype. So in this case, one quarter of children will receive the, the uh, bad copy from both parents, and they will show the phenotype. And those are usually associated with loss of function mutations where the gene and activity is uh, lost. So one half of the children will receive one copy, they won't typically show any phenotype for a classic recessive disease, but they have a chance if they mate with somebody who also has a copy of generating kids. And there are other patterns of inheritance with mitochondrial, always going down through the maternal line because the mothers pass on the variant. Uh, X-linked recessive, which is just a version of recessive, but because the X um, is often matched up with a Y and the, and the genes don't match between the X and the Y, you can get the disorder with one copy, and so males tend to show X-linked recessives, but you can also get X-linked dominant diseases. And the thing that you'll hear an awful lot about in this course is complex diseases where you can't match the perfect pattern of inheritance, and the reason you can't do that is the genetic variant doesn't determine the phenotype by itself. If it did, you would be able to follow a pattern, but you can't, so it takes more than just the DNA variation to cause the phenotype. And that leads to the concept of penetrance, which is the likelihood that a person with particular genotype will show the phenotype. 
So a, a dominant disease that shows a perfect pattern of 50-50 inheritance is said to have a phenotype that is completely penetrant, or 100%. The typical variation that you're going to see associated with diabetes or heart disease or inflammatory bowel disease individually has a very low penetrance. If all you had was that variant, you probably would not get the disease. But with a combination of enough of the variants and enough small effects added together, you will. So if you want to go into the genome, you have a phenotype that you're interested in, and you want to find the DNA sequence that is associated with that phenotype, I'm not talking now about complex disease. I'm talking about phenotypes that show a clear pattern of inheritance. You really got two ways to go. One is to choose candidates based on hypotheses of disease mechanism or on results for phenotypic model systems. And this was the standard in biology through up until about 2000, uh, 1995 to 2000, where people would uh, take a disease, understand what tissue it's affecting, make some hypothesis about how they thought that tissue worked, and go test the individual genes that they thought were important there. And this led to an awful lot of uh, negative results and an awful lot of false positive results because the individual genes being tested simply had to achieve a p-value of 0.05 and everybody said, oh, this is involved. That particularly was bad for psychiatric disease uh, where lots and lots of genes were implicated in psychiatric disease that were based on very, very small underpowered data sets. The other approach is to take an unbiased approach to scan all the chromosome regions for evidence of loci that affect disease expression. And in the case of a clearly inherited disease, a dominant disease, you expect to find one location in a given family that's associated with that. The problem was, of course, you needed the methods to be able to do that, and we'll, we'll get to those in a second. If you were going, however, for a dominant or a recessive disease to track the, the disease through families and your way to find the expression, the, the disease that affected the expression, the, the genotype that affected the expression of that phenotype, you all had the knowledge that the DNA was packed into chromosomes as single strings that were being passed down. So clearly, if the phenotype was being passed down in a particular pattern, you expected the chromosome or the chromosome region that contained that DNA sequence to be passed down in the same pattern. And so the ability to track those is what really led to the beginning of finding disease genes using DNA technology. Uh, because what you would do is you'd correlate the inheritance of the genotype with the phenotype. So what you needed for genotype is you needed a DNA sequence that varied between the two chromosomes in an individual, and then you just follow which version of that DNA variant was passed on to children, and you'd say, was the phenotype passed on at the same time? And you'd do enough of those tests to get a statistical significance for the correlation. Well, the DNA that's passed on on the chromosomes fortunately is not passed on as a single long string that remains intact through the entire process. The two chromosomes present in an individual recombine by crossing over and exchanging DNA, but they, the important fact is they do so in a linear fashion. So what you end up with in every generation is that the child has a set of chromosomes that is a linear mosaic of the two chromosomes that were present in the parent. So each parent generates a linear mosaic that goes down to the child, which means that if you were able to color the original chromosomes in the grandparental generation, and you knew that there was a genotype associated with a dominant trait in that red on that particular region, you wouldn't see red going all the way down associated with the phenotype for the entire chromosome, only that particular region, because the rest of it would recombine away to other colors. And so by the end of the second generation, the kids who have that red at that particular location will get the phenotype. The kids who, don't, who have red elsewhere on the chromosome but don't have that at that location will not get the phenotype. So in a dominant trait, it's just a matter of how do you follow the red. Well, with DNA technology and being able to look at DNA differences, you simply follow the DNA difference and say, does it correlate with the inheritance? Same thing with recessive, where now you're tracking either two differences or if you're dealing with a consanguineous mating of two individuals who are related to each other in the, in the past, then you'd, in the grand parental generation, both chromosomes would be the same color, essentially. 
they'd have the same variant. But, but you can inactivate the same gene different ways. And so in this case, we've got two different variants. The children who are going to be affected at the bottom have a green from this line and a blue from that line. The other two on the right with arrows are carriers. And this child is free of that defective gene and will never pass it on. So tracking the regions of the chromosome is linkage analysis. This is what we used for, oh, 20 years. Uh, in the 80s, beginning with using the ability to detect DNA sequences by restriction fragment cutting, where a restriction fragment sees a particular sequence and makes a cut, which means that if you cut the entire genome, any piece of DNA fragment size will be determined by where the cutting sites were on either side. And if there was a DNA sequence variant in one of the cutting sites, the enzyme wouldn't cut, the fragment size would change. And so you had what was called a restriction fragment length polymorphism. And we tracked those across the genome for years until uh, somebody figured out that simple sequence repeats like GA, 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 GA over and over again uh, tended to be unstable and change in size. And so we started tracking those because PCR enabled came along and enabled the ability to look at the size of, of repeat uh, fragments. And uh, subsequently, as technology improved, we got to the point of single nucleotide polymorphisms being all over the place. But basically, in the end, it all comes down to either a direct analysis where you're looking for the causative mutation and tracking it in the family, or an indirect analysis where you're using genetic markers. Now, for direct analysis, you either have to already know what you're looking for, or you have to really believe that you have the ability out of the millions of variations you can get in the human genome to home directly in on the one that matters. And that's kind of unrealistic and not very powerful because it's unrealistic. So indirect analysis of genotype is the standard in first track genetic analysis to relate genotype to phenotype. And indirect simply means that because the chromosomes are passed on as a linear mosaic with exchange events, the chances of an exchange event between the genotype site and the site that actually does cause the phenotype varies with how far apart they are. And so if you're about a million bases away from the variant that causes the phenotype, but you have a nice variant that you can track in the family, you're a million bases away, you expect actually that they're going to track together 99% of the time. Because recombination occurs on average 1% of the time for a million base pairs. And it varies from region of the genome to region of the genome, but it really means that if you have a decent sized family, you can track the inheritance of a site for a dominant phenotype, and you can show statistically significant correlation somewhere within usually about 10% recombination, so anywhere 10 million bases on either side of the, of the gene that's causing the, defect, the uh, phenotype, uh, and that it doesn't take all that many events to achieve statistical significance. If you have perfect co-inheritance in a linkage study in one family, it only takes 11 events to achieve statistical significance. Uh, now, that's a large family, and most of the large families uh, that uh, have a particular interesting phenotype have actually been studied over the years using that technology, and many, many, many disease genes have been linked. But you want, in many cases, to go beyond that, and beyond that means smaller families, rarer phenotypes, uh, phenotypes that aren't associated with perfect 100% penetrance, and complex phenotypes where there's not really any kind of inheritance pattern at all, just a, a, a greater chance of having the phenotype if you're in a family that had somebody else who had the phenotype. And that leads to what you're going to hear most about in genetics today, which is association studies. And association studies are correlating the presence of genotype with phenotype. The difference is minimal. In linkage, you're tracking the inheritance of a chromosome region through a family. In association, you're basically tracking the inheritance of a chromosome region through human history. Because at some point in human history, the variant occurred that's going to be associated with the phenotype, and it occurred on a chromosome that has a pattern of DNA variation. And it's that DNA variation that you're looking for. You can't look for it in related individuals because you don't have those related individuals. But they're really all related back to the same ancestor if they have the same stretch of chromosome with the same sets of variants on it. And so you're looking for that. You're just doing linkage in historical terms rather than in family terms. And we'll skip over that. 
Okay, so how do you do it? Like I said, in the, in the old days, restriction fragment length polymorphisms, then simple sequence repeats, and you were dependent on somebody having described a DNA variation, and uh, uh, in the beginning, you didn't even have to have it mapped to a chromosome. If it was a good variant, you could go map it to a chromosome afterwards once you, you knew it was important for your disease. Uh, but people figured out that putting a map together that actually enabled you to look systematically at all chromosome regions was a good idea. And so they used high-frequency polymorphisms to do that. Uh, they eventually decided that having the map defined with a standardized set of polymorphisms would be good, and that led to the HapMap project because uh, uh, the, the critical technical hurdle was do you type each individual polymorphism by itself, or can you multiplex and type as many as possible? And ideally, you'd like to type all the polymorphisms in the entire genome all at once, Single nucleotide polymorphism arrays allowed that to happen. You could simultaneously type a million or more SNPs, single nucleotide polymorphisms, and generate data for the whole genome. So if you simply define the standard pattern of SNPs to be ones that are of reasonable frequency, the likelihood is I'm going to detect it in any family that I look at. It acts as an indirect marker for the chromosome region that contains it. You'll be able to do either linkage or association uh, simultaneously with a DNA sample with, for the whole genome. Uh, but it's not always true that the haplotype, the DNA variant that came down through human history that's associated with the phenotype is a common one. Sometimes it's a little rarer, maybe because it was selected against, because the phenotype is not a good thing to have. In that case, you need lower frequency polymorphisms. And so people gradually move their way down to looking for lower frequency polymorphisms and polymorphisms that had a greater likelihood of having a significant functional, functional impact. And that typically was variations that were in protein coding sequence, because if you change the code of the protein, you're more likely to have a functional impact. Then sequencing came along, and it became possible to generate lots and lots of sequence cheaply without relying on a pre-existing knowledge of the genotype variations that occurred, which meant you were able to type an individual by sequencing their genome and finding the variants that were private to them that you hadn't seen before, that were so rare that you just hadn't run across them or hadn't believed them when you saw them because you didn't have multiple replicates of them. So you now have, with sequencing, the ability to do the entire genome, again, all at once, more expensive still, although not that much more expensive than doing SNP arrays, and the ability to look at variation at all of these levels. So you combine all of these techniques over the years, you gradually went from diseases that were really clearly inherited and common enough that you could get lots of families to diseases that were somewhat rarer uh, and you couldn't get as many families to diseases that were very common but didn't show a pattern of inheritance and allowed you to do association in the genome. And all of these techniques apply across that spectrum. Now, the critical thing for us, we were looking for disease genes that were uh, inherited in a clear pattern, is what you got, what you get when you got there, and, and it really proved out that had we chosen a candidate route, it really would not have worked. Of all the disease genes that we worked on over at MGH in the uh, Molecular and Genetics Unit, which began this kind of approach back in 1980, there was only one where a candidate approach worked, and that was hyperkalemic periodic paralysis, which is this disorder where um, it's dominant. If you're a, a jogger, you go out running in the morning before breakfast, and then you come back and you eat a banana or two for breakfast, and you find 15 minutes later that you're paralyzed. You can't get up and you can't move. And it's all because your sodium channel and muscle depolarizes and doesn't repolarize, and you get excess potassium outside the cell, and so it's called hyperkalemic periodic paralysis. We guessed that was the sodium channel based on phenotype, and, and for once we were right. But for every other disease we've worked on, biology didn't lead to the particular gene that was caused. Genetics, in an unbiased way, led to it. So the fundamental principle of applying genetics, why genetics is so powerful, is that it provides an effective unbiased tool for discovering factors that trigger or modify disease without any prior knowledge of the nature or mechanism. So it kind of turns the research path on its head and takes into account the first step in the scientific process, which is often ignored. Uh, people think of the scientific process as being generate a hypothesis, go test the hypothesis, try to disprove it. 
But in that, you're missing the previous step, which is observation. You have to have observation before you generate the hypothesis. You can't just go out and generate hypotheses without observation. So the unbiased search here basically is the observation step that gets you to the point of being able to do a reasonable hypothesis. And fortunately, it's unbiased. And so you take what you get. But what you get comes from the actual individuals who have the process going on that you're trying to study. It doesn't come from a mouse that looks like it, or it doesn't come from uh, a model system that may or may not replicate what you're looking for. So this led over the years to a kind of a con conceptual view of human genetic research as it applied to disease, which is that it really is kind of a cycle that involves patients and families where you have to describe the phenotype you're interested in, use the rules of genetics and the technologies at the level that they'd advance to to discover the underlying genes or DNA variations. That enable you then to make use of the model systems that had been the standard up until then of, of knock-in mice or transgenic mice, uh, flies, et cetera, where you could look at phenotype but you weren't sure that similar phenotypes were actually related to what's going on in people. So this enables you to look at genotype in those organisms and match the genotype and look for what the effects were now on a completely different genetic background but with exactly the same genetic variation. A, a different way of looking at your model systems that ultimately was aimed at leading to immediately better diagnostics but over time better management and a rational therapy based on the mechanism of the uh, disease rather than, again, the standard up until the time had been a trial and error based on hypothesis in uh, human disease. Now you're, you're able to define a mechanism from human patients themselves with the hope that that will be more effective in leading to a therapy because you're going to attack the actual mechanism going on and lead to benefit to patients and families. And what I want to use this cycle for is to get across the idea that even in a dominant genetic disease, you don't go around the cycle once. You go around it multiple times because genetics has power beyond simply identifying a gene. It has the ability to inform all these parts of the cycle. So I'm going to use as an example Huntington's disease, my favorite, which I've worked on for 35 years. And hopefully we're getting to the point soon where there may be a treatment for it, but there isn't yet. The clinical view of Huntington's disease is that uh, Essentially, it's a disorder of midlife onset where up until that time that it has onset, a an expert neurologist can't tell there's anything wrong with you. It occurs in about 1 in 8,000 1 in 10,000 individuals. And after onset, it leads to a progressive writhing disorder. Uh, it's kind of a disorder where you first have little adventitious movements, might fidget with this or whatever, gradually gets to the point where you're constantly writhing and it affects all parts of the body, and the only time you're not moving is when you're asleep. You have to, in the end, after a few years of having this disease, be protected from those movements because you can't control them. So I've seen individuals with severe Huntington's disease who, when you're in the room with them, you hear this clicking sound, and the clicking sound is the small amount of teeth that they have left rubbing against it because they've been rubbing their teeth for years and years and years constantly. Or they have pads that protect them from driving the limbs together at particular locations and just working their way all the way through the skin. They, they lose enormous amounts of weight. They have to be protected. They uh, move constantly. And eventually, they die usually of heart disease from the constant movement and loss of weight or from aspiration pneumonia because they can't swallow properly. So it's a horrible disease. And uh, while movement is the major part of it, there are other aspects but they're not the kind of intellectual decline that you'd see in Alzheimer's disease. The, the, the individuals still are very aware, very conscious, and very, e very eager to communicate even late in the disease, which they couldn't do, although now with computer technology and keyboards, they are able to communicate. And you realize that they're really just locked into this body that they can't control. Uh, they, they are psychiatric symptoms that occur in some individuals, uh, impulsive and, and um, uh, behavior uh, is one that's really important. And in fact, when you talk to the individuals who've had the disease for many years, they kind of discount the movement disorder. They find that the effects on their intellect and psyche are uh, more bothersome to them 
Uh, and so there's some of the treatment that is aimed at the disease has been aimed at palliative treatment of psychiatric symptoms uh, rather than the movement disorder uh, because there is no treatment to slow the progress of the disease. They die about 15 years after onset typically and onset typically occurs in midlife but can occur as early as uh, childhood, five years old, uh, and as late as uh, 80s and 90s. But typically, the typical individual has onset between 35 and 55. Now, if you look at the pathologist's point of view rather than the, the neurologist's point of view, you have a disorder where there's a particular region of the brain that shows loss of cells that destroys the architecture. And that's the striatum where the caudate nucleus is bulging into the ventricle of the brain. We've just got one slice of it here. I guess I missed my slide that had the whole brain. Uh, and that gradually loses cells to the point where uh, it becomes concave. The cells that are lost are medium spiny neurons. They make up about 80% of that region and they destroy the architecture. At the time that you have the onset of the disease, you've already lost 30 or 40% of those medium spiny neurons. So by imaging now, you could look before onset a little bit and see that there's a difference. But again, you've only moved the ability to see the disease a few years with uh, imaging studies of the brain rather than clinical uh, neurological symptoms. If I had the whole brain here, which I don't know why I forgot, um, you'd see that in fact, while this architecture is destroyed here, the rest of the brain is also affected. There's cell loss in the rest of the brain, uh, but it's, it's sporadic. It's not focused in one area. And so that by the time an individual dies, they've overall lost about 30% of their brain weight. So massive effect. Now, if you look at the geneticist's point of view, you can ignore all of those things and just put them all together and say that makes a black symbol or that makes a colorless symbol. Black symbol means they have the phenotype. Colorless means they don't. Obviously, circles are females, squares are males. You pass the defect down as a dominant trait. So 50% of the individuals who have a parent who has that have a chance of getting it. And you track markers. And in this case, we had restriction fragment length polymorphisms when we first studied this. And it turned out that for one restriction fragment uh, uh, set of sites, there was a variation in DNA sequence at both ends. So if there's a sequence variation at both ends, there are four possible results rather than two possible changes in size, okay? And we call them A, B, C, and D. It's just a name. Okay, so in this particular family, if you just look on the left-hand side, yeah, left-hand side, you'll see that the C pattern is tracking with the inheritance of the disease. If you go over to the right-hand side, you'll see that there's an individual who has two Cs. Now, C is, a, is a, just a marker. It's out there in the population. Everybody's got a chance of having C. It's, you know, maybe 25% of chromosomes. But in this particular family, you go back a generation, see that both parents had Huntington's disease. So that individual who has CC, number 12, is an individual who has two copies of the mutant gene and no copies of the normal gene. And this is a disease that is unusual in this sense that it is a complete dominant as opposed to most of the diseases you'll see out there in humans being called dominant. Most of the diseases in the human population called dominant are really co-dominant. Co-dominant meaning one copy is sufficient to cause phenotype, two copies makes a much worse phenotype. Dominant means two copies looks exactly like one copy. It's a true dominant disease. And that turns out to be true in Huntington's disease. Two copies of the mutant gene isn't any worse than one copy of the mutant gene. It's one is sufficient to engage the entire process. Okay, so now we think about putting those all together and the disease is a, a lifelong process in which you've got a normal individual and you've got somebody who inherits this HD mutation and the presumption that there are changes going on prior to the point at which you reach clinical diagnosis. And of course, I just pointed one out to you, which is that if you now do imaging because you've lost a certain percentage of the cells in the striatum prior to clinical diagnosis, that becomes a step 
prior to clinical diagnosis, it's on this red path, but something must have led to that cell loss. So there are biochemical consequences going on. There, there are events happening. An individual who inherits that gene can be considered as never being completely identical physiologically to a normal individual. And the goal would be to try to understand what's going on there in order to be able to prevent ever getting to clinical diagnosis. And that's one of the things genetics hopefully will allow us to do. The linkage analysis that was done in that kind of family um, led to a region on chromosome 4 where linkage said that everything between a marker called D4S98 and D4S10 tracked 100% with Huntington's disease. Now, we had to then turn to find the gene to association. When I say that those marker alleles track with Huntington's disease, that means within a family. Doesn't mean that every family has the same pattern of markers. All that matters is, is there a mutation on a particular chromosome that causes the phenotype and what's the background pattern of alleles? In a given family, it's always going to be the same background pattern of alleles because you've inherited from a common ancestor right down through the family. But if the mutations occurred more than once in human history, every time it occurs, it's going to be on a different background chromosome. So that will still work for linkage as long as you stay within a family. But as soon as you have to move beyond families, to the human history association method, then you're dependent on how many different times the mutation occurred as to what the pattern's going to look like. And so we turned to association to try to identify markers that were associated with Huntington's disease rather than just tracking in a family. And it led to this region in red that was present more often in Huntington's disease than in normals, but it wasn't present in every Huntington individual as a particular pattern of markers. Uh, it was just more often. So we had to, to, to come up with a way to make that as informative as possible. And if you have single nucleotide polymorphisms, you only got two choices. But if you have these simple sequence repeats, you got lots of choices because it, it can generate multiple alleles. There might be 18, 20, 22, 23, 24, 25 repeats, and each one of those is trackable. Okay? So we set out to generate markers with single sequence repeats simple sequence repeats, and we did generate a number of them that honed that region down, but one of the markers that we looked at was a CAG repeat, and that turned out to actually be the defect. When you PCR amplify that sequence, normal individuals, everybody in this room, will have a variation at that site that could be anywhere from six CAGs to 34 CAGs. If you look at an individual with Huntington's disease, they will invariably have more than 35 CAGs. So the difference between a Huntington's disease causing chromosome and a normal chromosome is as little as one CAG. And in fact, there's some fuzziness around that edge, as I will um, get, I'll get to the reason for it. They may not get to it. If you look right around the region from 36 to 40, you can go out in the population and find elderly individuals who have repeats in that range who haven't shown the clinical symptoms of Huntington's disease. So that, from the point of view of clinical diagnosis of Huntington's disease, would be a small degree of non-penetrance. That doesn't mean they aren't 100% penetrant for other phenotypes. If you went and did imaging, you might, in fact, see that they have already got some shrunken striatum. So, the definition of penetrance depends on the phenotype that you're looking at. It could be 100% penetrant or zero penetrant for different phenotypes, okay? In this particular case, if you get above 40 repeats and you live a normal lifespan, you're going to show symptoms of Huntington's disease. So above 40, it's considered to be 100% penetrance. The repeat codes for glutamine. It's in a very large protein called Huntington that we had no idea existed until we cloned it. We actually thought it was two genes as we were doing part of the process because we couldn't connect the cDNAs, but eventually turned out to be one. Uh, and the function of it has been worked on for 25 years. It's got lots of functions. Uh, I'm not going to go into it in great depth. I said that you uh, depended on how many times the mutation occurred as to how the pattern of association would look. Well, it turns out that the, the mutation has occurred many times in human history, uh, but not dozens of times. So there are a limited number of chromosomes that show a uh, pattern that you can recognize as being a haplotype of markers 
that carries a Huntington's disease mutation that you will also see in the normal population, but typically is more frequent in the disease population than in the normal because it's enriched for by the fact that you're ascertaining those with the disease. The most common pattern we've called HAP1, using a set of SNPs across the disease gene, where the repeat is actually where this N is right after the AAG, and these other SNPs uh, become part of the pattern that, that uh, relates, as long as they're on the same chromosome in the same pattern, it's called HAP1, they have a high chance of having the Huntington's disease gene compared to normal. So 50% of the Huntington's genes out in the human population are caused by either HAP1 or HAP5, which is a very slight variant. It only differs at the first base, presumably due to some event that changed the A to a T. The other 50% have a mixture of haplotypes. The most frequent normal chromosome, so accounts for 30% of European normal chromosomes, is HAP8. So HAP8 you'll see in lots and lots of people. Very occasionally you'll see a mutation on HAP8 and HD. So there's a, a complex pattern, but you can use that complex pattern to study both the, the uh, sequence that you're looking at as the repeat, but also background effects of the region. So far, background effects of the haplotype haven't shown up in clinical symptoms. So background effects like variations that are going to let change the level of expression of the gene, et cetera, they have not shown up as changing phenotype yet. This is just a pie chart of those frequencies. I'll give you an idea of why that red one really accounts for enormous amount, but there's enrichments for others as well. And if you move to non-European populations, this pattern shifts a little bit where HAP12 becomes, for example, very much more frequent in Asians. So back to the cycle. Okay, I said that you could go around this cycle as part of your sort of uh, approach to, to a disease, Huntington's disease being the example. We've now moved around the cycle to the point where we've changed diagnostics. You can do DNA diagnostics based on that repeat. You can do differential diagnosis if a person doesn't look exactly like Huntington's disease. You can determine they have it. You can do predictive testing by determining whether a person later in life is going to get Huntington's disease by simply typing that repeat. So we've done something for uh, predictive testing, uh, which has led to uh, prevention because people have uh, the ability to have children who don't have Huntington's disease now, even though they, they are at risk themselves. Uh, we have had a limited impact on management uh, based on, again, the testing and the consequences thereof. And the major effort has been into trying to develop a uh, mechanism-based therapy for which you need to understand the mechanism. Well, you're starting out with a protein, you have no idea what the function is. So you got to work on the function. You work on the function in model systems, may or may not be relevant to humans, etc. The question becomes, how can we facilitate going around the cycle again with genetics to inform all of these things? And the way of doing that is to continue the genotype-phenotype relationships. So I said that there are all different CAG sizes in the normal population. There are also lots of different CAG sizes in the disease population because the CAG is unstable and changes in size through meiotic transmissions. Turns out in the normal population, those changes in size don't occur very often. So you can use that marker to track within families and follow it clearly with inheritance. But in the disease population, it actually changes quite frequently. Many families in every generation, it changes. And so that instability would not allow you to easily track the chromosome by specific size, just saying expanded or not expanded. But it also says something about being able to do genotype-phenotype correlations because it means you can look at individuals who have different sizes of CAG and say, is there anything clinically different about them? And the answer is, yeah, they have a different age of onset on average. So the average age of onset varies very strongly with CAG repeat number. The longer the CAG repeat, the earlier the onset of the disease. That has enabled studies in model systems where, again, now, instead of trying to replicate the phenotype, which was done for years by injecting chemicals into the brain and trying to find mutants that looked like the, the brain pathology in Huntington's disease. Instead, now you can actually make a mouse that has the identical mutation and go study it. The mouse that has the identical mutation doesn't show symptoms like HD, uh, but it does have differences. And you can take those down to the molecular level and start finding differences in the brains of these mice relatively early that you can now go look for in Huntington's disease as part of that red process that occurred before clinical diagnosis to try and lead you to what's going on. 
And in fact, by following the genetics, you can show that all the differences that you do see in the mice uh, that don't die early but do have phenotypic differences in a variety of domains do occur in a CAG length dependent manner, just like onset occurs in a CAG length dependent manner. I'm going to skip the energy, low energy stuff. Uh, well, maybe we won't. This is just a slide that shows that that CAG, which is causing Huntington's disease and varies in the disease range, I mentioned it also varied in the normal range. Well, it, it's in a gene that codes for protein, that changes the glutamine length. It has functional consequences. If I look in normal individuals, everybody to the left of that blue, there's a correlation between the ATP-ADP ratio in cells from those normal individuals, just like there's a correlation in the affected individuals. So you've got a functional polymorphism. Whether that particular function is related to causing the disease, we don't know. But clearly, it's a functional polymorphism, and you can use it to study the protein. I'm going to skip that and go to this one. OK. So out of all these things, I'm coming back to the idea that the, the, the genetics can tell you things that you can use in trying to study the mechanism. The fact that, that humans uh, who are heterozygous for inactivation that I haven't talked about have no HD phenotype. It means you can go out in the population, you find people who only have one copy of the good gene because some genetic event has knocked out the other copy. You find, in fact, that they have no phenotype. I think it's not on this slide because this is an older slide. We've subsequently identified individuals who have two bad copies of the hunting gene. They, uh, we know that from the mice, complete inactivation of the hunting gene is lethal in embryogenesis, just right around gastrulation. So the individuals that we found in the human population who have sequence variants that knock down Huntington function, don't knock it out completely. They are hypomorphs, and so they make a little bit of Huntington function, and as a result, they're viable, uh, but they have a uh, severe neurodevelopmental neuro phenotype that is in some ways comparable to Rett's syndrome. So it's an important gene. You, you need to have it, but having only one copy is sufficient to have normal development be uh, normal adult certainly doesn't cause Huntington's disease. So even in the normal range, you've got very consequences in neuronal and non-neuronal cells measured by biochemical and molecular effects. So the specificity of the cells that are dying, the fact that your muscle cells are not dying, even though the protein's made there, or the gene is expressed there, and the cells, in the medium spiny neurons in the striatum die very early, cells in the cortex might die a little later, says that there's something about the protein or the gene that creates cell specificity beyond simply being expressed somewhere. And the length of that CAG is the primary determinant for what's going on. So part of this, the consequence of this is you better understand what the protein does in order to understand the disease. Another is that, did I have that slide? I did have that slide. I did not have that slide. Huh. The other is the final one. Some of the remaining variation in the rate of pathogenesis is determined by other unlinked genetic factors. And that, for some reason, ah, is here. I'm going to go back and forth. So this is the same slide that I showed you before that shows the mean age of onset. If you look at the range of ages of onset associated with repeat lengths, it looks more like this. So something has to move the age of onset away from the mean. And it could be environmental, it could be experience, it could be genetic. It turns out that when you now look in the families that you've studied and say, well, what, is there any familiarity to this age of onset difference from the average in the population? The answer is yes. So there are genetic factors that imposed on the background of an expanded CAG change the age of onset that an individual would have. Let me go back to see what I missed. OK, so the conclusion from all of this genetics, without actually going in and doing any uh, studies in the lab, is that HTCAG expansion confers a gain of function to the Huntington protein or to the Huntington gene. I'm, gonna, I'm qualifying that based on recent results. Uh, that acts through some aspects of its structure, localization, or function. That is, progressive enhancement or dysregulation rather than the loss of a normal activity of Huntington or of the gene. 
And so the consequences, as I said, are it's critical to understand the function of the Huntington and um, regulation of the gene. The uh, CAG relationship gives you a quantitative relationship as opposed to a plus minus, which is mu much more powerful than a plus minus relationship. You've got a quantitative relationship to study your sit model systems. Essentially, if you're studying something that could be going on in Huntington's disease, it had better show variation with the CAG repeat length as a starting point. Because if it always occurs um, with an expanded CAG, you may be looking at a, a, a true consequence, but not one that's related to the initiation of the disease. And so the final one is that this idea that the pathogenic effects of mutant Huntington or of the gene can be modified by other genes, which could provide additional clues. So going around the cycle again, what we need is we need a phenotype that defines that modification. The phenotype, as I pointed out, is that they have clinical diagnosis at different times, even though they start with the same CAG repeat length. And so the uh, phenotype becomes how, how far does an individual's actual onset differ from what we would have expected based on the CAG repeat length. It turns out that if you do a statistically robust set of individuals, meaning repeats from 40 to 55, where you have sufficient individuals to uh, qualify for the particular statistical tests you're going to use as being applicable, you end up with 10 CAGs corresponding to about 28 years difference in age of onset. If you look at any given CAG, you got a range of about 30 years of variation. So the variation effect is quite substantial compared to the driver of the disease, which is the CAG, and therefore potentially have consequences. OK, so there are two ways that we've gone about looking at what are those genetic variations. One is to simply take that standard curve and say, how far is a person off the curve? That becomes a quantitative residual of age of onset. Essentially, you have the age of onset. You correct for CAG. What's left? That's the phenotype. And that's quantitative, so you can analyze it by regression, continuous analysis. Or you can just go to the extremes the people who are way off on either side, and compare genotype in those people. So instead of being a quantitative trait, it becomes a case control type study of uh, either end of the, of the distribution. So you have two different ways of looking at it. One by uh, uh, that depends on the, on the quantitation of the residual precisely, and the other one that depends only generally on the quantitation of the residual and, and measures allele frequencies. When you look at the residual age of onset, you get a nice normal distribution. That's why that population is statistically well behaved. And you start your way around the cycle. Now the phenotype is residual age of onset. You go and do exactly the same set of processes. But now you've got a phenotype that, while it's heritable, doesn't show a Mendelian pattern of inheritance. It's more in this complex nature of um, uh, not being able to completely predict what any individual of the family is going to have with respect to residual but more likely to be a, uh, early onset or late onset if you're in a family with somebody else who has early onset or late onset. You have the same sets of technologies, except now you're down in the ability to look at lower frequency or uh, look at sequence level changes, as well as high frequency polymorphisms simultaneously. You go do the, the standard study, which is genome-wide association analysis, type all the individuals at once, generate the SNP patterns, look for SNP alleles that are either associated with that regression model of uh, age and onset residual or that are different in frequency in the case control set of dichotomous early onset versus late onset. And what you come out with is genome-wide significant peaks. This is from a study of only about 4,000 individuals. So this is not like the risk analyses that you might have heard about from SAKE last week, or if not, we'll hear about um, in the rest of the, of the course. Uh, this is now modification rather than risk. The risk is 100% determined. You're going to get Huntington's disease by having that CAG repeat expanded. It's just a matter of the, man, the variation, the manifestations caused by it. So these are modifier alleles with a very strong peak on chromosome 15. Uh, there's a peak on chromosome 8 that's significant. There's a peak on chromosome 3 that was not significant at this point, but with a follow-up study, it jumped up above the line. There are a couple of others, and there are more studies like this going on that are identifying many more 
uh, variations that uh, affect uh, onset. But this one makes the point. So here's the chromosome 15 locus now blown up. You can look at the, the p-values for all of those different SNPs. And what you come up with is a red dot and a green dot. What I mean by the red dot and the green dot is the red dot is the peak SNP. If you now condition the analysis on that SNP, so you're removing the signal that comes from the association of that SNP, down below, you're left with something that's still genome-wide significant. That's the green dot. If you condition on the green dot, you're left with the red dot. So there are two different effects here. And it turns out that the red one is associated with earlier age of onset by about five years, and the green one is associated with later age of onset by about a year and a half to two years. Now, those sound like small numbers, but compared to the average age of onset of 40 years, those are really big numbers for naturally occurring variation impacting on disease. These are big effect sizes, okay? And there are two different ones, the likelihood, of course, being the chance of hitting the same locus with two different effects and being different genes is pretty unlikely. And in fact, this, this effect seems to home in on the gene FAN1. The other uh, one on chromosome 8 uh, is a single version. You condition on the red SNP, which is the top one, nothing's left out. So there's a single effect there. And you can go on in the MLH one. I don't know if it's here. Yeah, it's here. Uh, same thing, single effect there. So at each locus, once you've got a signal, you can then home in and say, is there anything below that? And when I say things disappear, well, these two lows are not great examples. But when I say things disappear, it means that, that once you condition, there's not something genome-wide significant. It doesn't mean there isn't something there. It just means that in the overall population, it didn't achieve genome-wide significance. But with more specific hypothesis testing, you can potentially find additional effects at these loci. And that's, again, another aspect of the work that's going on. And additional effects have been found at these and other loci that impact. So there, there's a, a, a range of loci that now impact. This last one on chromosome 3 is uh, signal is above MLH1. MLH1 is a mismatch repair gene that was implicated previously in a mouse study, the mouse study re resulting from modeling in mice precisely with the genetics that you see in humans. So the CAG repeat was knocked into the mouse gene identically to the way it is in the human. The mice were bred. Just like humans, the mice showed a variation in the CAG from generation to generation, although in the mice it tended to go down rather than go up, which said is a difference. However, they also showed somatic variation, which you see in people as well. There are changes in CAG repeat during the life of the individual in different cells to different degrees. And in the mice, that happened as well. So Vanessa Wheeler over at MJH did a mouse cross to find modifiers of that somatic variation and what she found was MLH1. So now you got MLH1 varying the precise genetic mouse model and showing up as varying age of onset in humans, which argues that maybe that somatic variation that occurs is important in determining onset. If we go back to FAN1, FAN1 is also involved in DNA repair, but not mismatch repair. It's involved in interstrand crosslink repair. So it raises a possibility. This one's not as clear. RRM2B is associated with mitochondrial function. Uh, it's also associated with uh, nucleotide pools. But the gene right next door to it, UBR5, is ubiquitin ligase that could be involved in degradation of proteins. And a lot of the work on Huntington's disease has, like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, related to protein aggregates that form in the cells. Unclear, needs more work to figure it out. OK, so if we go back quickly to finish this off, to the life cycle of Huntington's disease. We've got a long pre-manifest period. Motor diagnosis is occurring, and that's a point that you can point to clinically uh, as being able to be compared between people because it's standardized in terms of diagnosis. Then you've got uh, uh, stages of decline until death. They involve chorea, cognitive impairment, motor impairment, some of which can be measured at a group level prior to clinical diagnosis, which mainly based on motor science. And we're looking for things that go on beforehand. We've now got things that modify the time that it takes to get to that motor diagnosis. 
So if they modify the time that it takes to get to motor diagnosis, they clearly had to have been working before motor diagnosis. The question is how long before motor diagnosis? So here's an example of looking at a study called PREDICT HD, which enrolled people based on their CAG length, not clinical symptoms. They didn't have clinical symptoms at the time they were enrolled. And if you look at the modifier genotype of the individuals and of the controls in the same study, and look at a phenotype, and in this particular case, the phenotype is the volume of the putamen, which is not the stretch of tissue bulging into the ventricle, but the stretch of tissue just inside of that. And it also atrophies in Huntington's disease. Uh, you get the following pattern. So start out with the chromosome 15 bad. We call it bad because it's earlier onset. And a lot of scientists don't like giving it a value judgment, but the patients don't mind. They, they clearly think getting earlier onset is bad. Uh, you look, and these are simply comparisons uh, uh, of the individual's and the range of variation that you see by genotype, where if the line doesn't cross the midline, it's considered to be a reliable or significant effect. The control 15 bad doesn't really show any difference between the control individuals, either for the baseline visit or the rate of change of that over subsequent visits. So you've got a, the, the baseline visit is the intercept, the rate of change is the slope. No difference in the controls, but if you look in the Cases, clearly, there's a big difference in genotype for both the size of the, of the putamen at baseline and the rate at which it gets smaller. If you go to the good one, you get the reverse effect. So you're detecting an effect of these modifier alleles now two decades before onset. So clearly, they're operating during that phase of the disease. If you could get back to that cycle, which I don't have as my next slide for a change, if you could get back to that cycle and think, whoa, I've got a change that's occurring two decades before clinical onset of disease. If I could go in and target that for therapy, maybe I could prevent ever getting to onset of the disease. And that's the state that we're at right now. The therapy for Huntington's disease, which is being tested, is knockdown of Huntington in clinical individuals to see whether reducing the protein in people who already have the disease is going to work. But we need mechanisms to use the genetics. And I've only given you the top line because there's a lot more studies coming in this realm. Use the genetics to look very early to prevent the disease from ever happening, which means we need both mechanism studies in humans, mechanism studies, and the ability to get through a regulatory system where you're putting treatments into people who aren't specifically defined as having disease, they're simply defined as people that you know are going to get the disease. So all of those things apply in Huntington's disease. You can now take all of this and just think about any other Mendelian disease, whether it be dominant or recessive, that shows variation in phenotype. If you can get variation in phenotype that is genetic, whether that variation is, you know, uh, in Huntington's disease, another one might be um, a psychotic behavior that occurs in some individuals versus none in other individuals, or early depression in Huntington's disease occurs in a lot of individuals, but there are some who escape it. Those are phenotypes that potentially are modified by particular uh, genotypes. Look at any other disease that shows variation, you have the potential, at least, of using this kind of approach, which basically means that even Mendelian disorders can be complex. They have a very strong main effect but the modifiers that vary them fit into the mode of, of um, complex disorder, small effects that add together to cause results. And of course, that leaves out the concept that some of them interact with each other to change effect sizes. But basically, the lesson from Mendelian genetics is it's, genetics is unbiased. It's a way to get to causative effects, whether they be clearly inherited or not, but when, even when you have them clearly inherited, it continues to be important to study the disease process because you can identify things that vary that phenotype. Thank you. Hopefully on time. <laughs>